Is everybody supposed to be very happy? No. But perhaps you dislike them as much as I do. Still, as far as go, I think it might have been worse. Do you? Very nearly was a great deal worse. Oh? Thank you. We were, it appears, to be treated to a little dancing exhibition. But now I understand where to be spared that horror. Mr. Lamontoff, I am that horror. It's a bit late for apologies, isn't it? Yes, a little late, I think. Well, saying I'm sorry. I'm terribly sorry. But you're not sorry I didn't dance, are you? No. Oh. May I ask why? And because, my dear Miss... Uh, Miss... Victoria Page. My dear Miss Page, if I accept an invitation to a party, I do not expect to find myself at an audition. Yes, you're quite right. Why do you want to dance? Why do you want to live? Well, I don't know exactly why, but... Uh, I must. That's my answer, too. Come with me. Where to? We are going to have a little talk. But I don't think I want to talk to you. Don't you worry, I'll do the talking. Hello and welcome to Book vs. Movie. This is a podcast where we read books that have been adapted into movies and then we try to decide which we like better, the book or the movie. I am Margot P. of ColoniaBook.com and this is my good friend and co-host Margot D. of Brooklyn Fit Chick. Hi everyone. And we have a very special guest today. We don't often have guests. Mm-hmm. Uh, but we, we we talked about this book actually a little a little while back. But we are delighted to have Dale Bridges here, who is the author of a book called The Mean Reds. Welcome, Dale. Thank you so much for having me. I don't want to pretend like you're not here. But for those of you who are new to the podcast, yes, this is a podcast where we talk about movies that have been adapted from books. But sometimes, because we do a brand new episode every single week, sometimes we are looking at things that are not traditionally considered to be a book. You know, maybe it's a play or a magazine article or um, a musical or a song even, um, or a children's story like we're going to be talking about today, although a very, very um, grim one. See what I did there? <laughs> um, hey <laughs> uh, But if you have suggestions for books and movies or stories and movies, as long as it's a movie that has been adapted from any kind of literary source, we will consider it. And it has to be something that um, is widely available for everyone to get their eyes in front of. So it's got to be streaming somewhere. And the book has to be, or the source material also has to be readily available. But given those ground rules, if you've got suggestions to make, there's a few places where you can make them, interact with other listeners of this podcast, and meet us on the internet. Yes, we have a basic Facebook page. Be sure to like it, but we're much more interactive in our Facebook group. You type in book VS movie podcast group and ask to join. It's a private group and we really do just talk about books and movies there. We're on Twitter. We're on Instagram and threads at book versus and movie spelled it all out. Or you can send us an email book versus movie podcast at gmail.com. And if you would like some stickers, uh, send us your address and we will drop them in the mail for you. And if you really enjoy the show and would like to help keep us in books and movies, you can also support us on Patreon. Yes, P-A-T-R-E-O-N. We've been doing the show now for nine years. We have dozens of episodes there. So basically everything from 2020 and previous to that, they're up on our Patreon wall. The Silence of the Lambs is dropping next. We just dropped Psycho. We're going to be dropping a few more coming up. But all you people that do that, it just helps us with the books and the movies and just the basic costs for the show to put it all together. And we really appreciate all of you that help us. And um, today we are talking, if you saw the title of this episode, you know that we are talking about the red shoes. Um, we have a lot to discuss, but before we get to that, we, the reason we picked, we should talk about the reason we picked this particular movie. Do you want to explain? Yes. So our guest today is Dale Bridges and he has a book called The Bean Reds. And 
Dale, can you give us sort of like the background of what the story is and what The Red Shoes has to do with your story? And it's a great book, by the way. We're both really enjoying it. Oh, thank you so much. Uh, absolutely. Yeah. So the book, sort of a detective noir, but in an odd, uh, untraditional way. Uh, the protagonist is a movie reviewer, a young movie reviewer who's obsessed with old movies in particular, to the point where he kind of uh, would rather live in a fantasy world where he imagines himself in an old movie. And he also imagines that he's uh, uh, been jilted by the love of his life from uh, college. His girlfriend left him for his best friend and went off to Hollywood to make movies. And they left him there and, and poor him. Uh, he works at a very small newspaper. He, uh, the, the editor, everybody else is busy, and there is a uh, an incident would happen where an exotic dancer has uh, had a tragic uh, accident and died in in their town. It's just a slip and fall, but since Sam is so obsessed with old movies, he can't just let it be a slip and fall. He has to look for drugs and gangsters and all these things, and at the same time, he finds out that there's a lo there's a local film festival in town, and he finds out that his former girlfriend, his ex-girlfriend, the love of his life is coming back into town with the the director, his best former best friend who stole her from him, and they are premiering a movie uh, in town. And all of these things are are pretty big stressors on Sam. And he's always he's always a little bit high and a little bit drunk. And uh, he's doing that more than usual. And this all comes to a head uh, towards the end as as his fantasy world gets away from him. Yeah, we are. Yeah, I really enjoyed it a lot. I love that every single chapter is um, titled after a classic movie. And it's very fun as you're reading to see like what the why you chose that particular movie to be the title of that chapter. It also it reminded me a little bit of one of my favorite Ray Bradbury stories called uh, Death is a Lonely Business. Who brain worked hard on that one. Um, <laughs> Yeah, yeah, where he's in he's that. in this like crumbling Hollywood backdrop and yeah. um but I loved the mystery of it and I love the the all of the vintage elements were really cool and yet it's definitely, you know, a modern day um it, this person who people talk about like being born in the wrong time, you kind of get that idea that he sort of feels that way and yeah, I really really am enjoying it's a very very fun read. Thank you. Yeah, I, I kind of forgot your other prompt to, to talk about uh, how the Red Shoes ties in. And, and thank you for bringing up. Yeah, each chapter is named after an old movie um, that either either something usually sort of just something with that happens within the chapter feels sort of spiritually connected to. Uh, but one of the chapters when Sam finally uh, gets to the strip club to to interview the owner and talk about uh, what happened uh, with the uh, young dancer. Uh, that chapter is called uh, The Red Shoes, uh, and I named it that up for a couple of reasons. Um, the first one is uh, kind of obvious, is that The Red Shoes is about dancing, and a strip club uh, is a place of dancing. And so, uh, and but then the other one is The Red Shoes is about um, obsession, right? And mm -hmm. how far should obsession go? And is there too far? Are you, you know, uh, is, are you willing to put art and your passion before even your own uh, emotional and physical health? Uh, and, you know, during this story, you you know that Sam is obsessed and you're not sure how far he's willing to let that as an obsession go. But in that chapter, you find out that he's willing to put his, you know, him, himself in danger in order to, you know, follow through with his obsession. So that's also why the chapter is named that. Were there classic movies that you had in mind when you were writing um, to, to, to have the, the kind of the chapter theme that you had to jettison? The the idea of naming them after uh, the naming the chapters after uh, movies kind of it wasn't at the end but it was I was more than halfway through the no novel before I I thought that that would be a good idea and a fun thing to do mm -hmm. um, and there are certainly a lot of classic movies that I love that I like I didn't get to find a way to work into the book um, although I give a nod to a lot of them in there uh, there's a lot of like little Easter eggs. Um, some of them pretty obvious and and some more obscure, which you don't really have to get in order to. But I just it's I think it's a really is a novel for movie lovers. That's what I wrote it in mind. Um, I'm you know, pretty obsessed with old movies myself. It's kind of a weird. My my father is uh, was a small town fundamentalist preacher. Uh, so growing up, I wasn't really allowed to go to the movies. There was only one movie theater in the town of Yuma, Colorado. Is about a, a 2,000 people there in one movie theater, and I wasn't allowed to go. 
Um, and we only, you know, sometimes would rent Disney movies and stuff like, you know, on Saturday afternoons after cartoons, the, they would play old movies on uh, one of the four channels that we got. Mm -hmm. And if it was in black and white, um, my, my father just didn't really bother me uh, with it because there's no cursing and there's no nudity in those. He didn't care about the violence, as much yeah. violence as he wanted. <laughs> um, so, uh, you know, I watched old Westerns and old Bogey and while well, my my peers were all into, you know, John Hughes and, and, and Rob mm -hmm. Lowe movies. I was, you know, way into Catherine and Aubrey Hepburn and dad, uh, you know, uh, Cary Grant and all those things. So, I mean, eventually I went to college and I, I did catch up on all the movies and I, I loved all those John Hughes movies and stuff, but I just always had, uh, you know, my first loves were those old movies. So that's where my, my own obsession started with. <laughs> Sam just sort of refusing to see the things that are in front of his face. So the reader is figuring things out um, before Sam is, right. um, but it's all, it's all coming together despite him, uh, even though it's happening all around him. I wouldn't say accidentally got a newspaper job, but um, I had never worked at a news. I'd never been a journalist before. And I, well, I guess the term is lied on my resume. And I told them that I had had some background uh, working at a newspaper in college uh, and they didn't check. So uh, I got a, I got a job when I was at a newspaper and worked my way up to the arts and entertainment editor position in Boulder, Colorado. And Boulder's kind of a funny, odd little place. I'm not if you're sure if you're familiar with it at all. But Work in Mindy, this... that's all I know about Boulder. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's got this weird position in the, it's just a small mountain town, but it's got this weird, like, larger position uh, in the, uh, you know, in the culture uh, as this, like, you know, very liberal place that um, got really... Uh, on the map in uh, the, <clears throat> the 60s, because Kerouac sort of discovered it, and Allen Ginsberg founded a uni uh, Buddhist university there. And then, you know, people just started coming. It's such a beautiful place. Wealthy people started buying up, and then the local people could no longer afford to live in their, their own city. So it was just an interesting place to be at, at that point in my life, and an interesting stage in my life. And that all sort of you know, I, you know, I melded together. Is that I guess. the Daily Camera? Is that what it's called? The Daily Camera is the daily newspaper there, but I was working for the Boulder Weekly, okay. which is the uh, alternative, alternative, smaller, much smaller newspaper there. Yeah. That's what happened to Lake Tahoe. My sister lived in Tahoe for years. Nobody could afford to live there now. All the, no. the millionaires and billionaires bought it all up. Yeah. Well, I mean, I'm living in Austin now, and it's yeah. kind of a similar problem. So I just, I need to move to a less cool city, I think is I, the thing. Exactly. I live in Lincoln, Brooklyn. Nebraska, the rent's not going to go up anytime soon or whatever. Uh, but then you have to live in Lincoln, Nebraska. So, that, you know, there's those, <laughs> those things. And I just realized as a lot of these chapters are movies that we've done on this show. Yes. Yeah. If not, if not most of them. I didn't go through and I thought I went through and highlighted, but I guess, I guess I didn't. Yeah, I think most of them. I think most of them are, are movies that we've covered, we've covered over so the years, many, which is kind of fun. <laughs> we've covered so I know you guys have been doing it for so long. Yeah, I was definitely flipping, like looking back through your archives and I'm like, oh, you, you guys are, you are, you're my people. You're yes. definitely going to understand <laughs> what's going on and your audience is perfect for like, yeah, this type of book. Yeah, it's, it was a fun book. It's a weird thing because most of us who, I like this podcast is great because most of us who love books, also love movies so like yeah. we love narratives right and so uh but you and you do see a lot of movie adaptations of books but you don't really see that many books where movies are uh, like sort of a primary theme in there i all like i want i want to read that you know i want i want that out there i would love to do that and then yeah when i'm writing this book i get to go back and rewatch a bunch of old movies uh, i have to for research you know right. Same. Uh, so <laughs> It was, I know how it that was is. fun to do. Yeah, your your book about the Brooklyn cinema. I mean, what a fun. Yeah, you like you're going to be stuck with this project for a couple of years. Yeah. So there's two things I always have when I'm starting off a thing of like one. Yeah. Do I am I going to be you know uh, I need to be interested enough. Do I want to do this research? Do I want to? And then the other is like I, I my wife kind of needs to sign off because of she's going to be living for it through with it for a couple right. of years right of like i'm going to be annoying her and, and like can you reread this paragraph cuz i put a comma in a different place you know <laughs> that kind of thing so let's talk a little bit about as speaking of obsession perfect time perfect segue to talk about 
we're not going to, we just said a, a little while ago, we're not going to go too far into Hans Christian Andersen. We just discussed him not too long ago. We do need to talk about him a little bit because there are some things in his, in his IRL uh, that are relevant yeah. to the story that we're talking about today. Hans Christian Andersen was born April 2nd, 1805. He is a legend in Copenhagen in Denmark. That's where he's from. They have statues of him everywhere. He is one of the uh, people, top people known for fairy tales. We discussed him in our Disney episode. We did a month of Disney in December. We talked about The Little Mermaid. Not the one that was just released, by the way. We stuck with the original Disney version, but we talked more about him there. He was an intense person. He was a very pious person. He was also someone personality wise. He was actually friends with Charles Dickens. He actually was so annoying to Dickens that Dickens had to kick him out of his house, which is kind of funny because Dickens was his own kind of the emperor's new clothes. Uh, like I said, the little mermaid, the princess and the pea, the snow queen and the ugly dumpling. Excuse me. The ugly dumpling. Dumpling, excuse me. I keep seeing Dumbelina. <laughs> Dumbelina. <laughs> anyway, he passed away in 1875. Like I said, he is considered one of the godfathers of fairy tales. He's definitely a hero in his native Denmark. And he wrote this story today. And we have a Karen in our story today. We do have a Karen. <laughs> Their main character is Karen. And Karen was also the name of uh, Hans Christian Andersen's sister. Yes. And he, oh. they didn't like each other very much, apparently. He thought she was very, once again, he was a pretty snickety guy. I guess not, guy. if you've yes. read the story. Yeah. <laughs> he Yikes. thought she was vain and selfish. And that's sort of, a, the, the, you know, some of these fairy tales, you're supposed to learn the lesson. Um, he was a very Christian-based person. So you're supposed to be somebody that you think about God in all of your life and and how you want to, you know, how you want to be accepted in the afterlife. It depends on how you deal with how you are in this world on the earth. And he apparently thought Karen wasn't so great, but this is about a girl. She's a peasant girl. She's very vain and she's spoiled and she has a pair of red shoes made for her. And is it her mother that has them made for her? She, yeah, she's, um, she's, like a like a wastrel in the street and one day she's adopted by this old woman who is um colorblind right and says oh he takes her in and and you know you're gonna i'm adopts her as her own and has she says oh i'm gonna have a pair of shoes made for you you know so you can be dressed up when we go to church because that's what good people do and um she's like okay she says i don't remember she sends her to the shoemaker but anyway she has the little girl pick out what she wants for her shoes. And the little girl picks out completely inappropriate red shoes for church, which <laughs> the pearl clutching of yeah. Hans Christian. <laughs> I always just imagine him just like salivating as he's like writing the story. Yeah, you really have to go back to the 1800s and think about like, I guess that would have been scandalous. You, it, know, like, you had to wear black shoes, shoes to church. You had to like not be. And this is also based, by the way, his father was a cobbler. And at one time somebody came in with a pair of shoes and they didn't like his work. And he was so offended that he took scissors and he cut them in half versus getting paid for the shoes. He wow. was just like, you don't appreciate me. You don't deserve my awesome shoe work that i'm doing here so she gets these shoes and these shoes make her feel great about herself she's already pretty vain and she keeps wearing them to church even though she's told you shouldn't be wearing them to church what part does she start dancing in them is it pretty okay so she's she's I read yeah this a so she's days ago sorry she gets the red shoes you know sneakily and under under dubious pretenses the old woman takes her to church thinking that she's dressed you know modestly with with respectable black shoes and uh, they show up at church and the whole church is scandalized by the little girl in the red shoes and there's an old soldier i think he is on the steps of the church right. and he he's he's creepy <laughs> we'll just put it that way and he's, a real creeper. he's a real creeper and he he says to this little girl he's like oh Oh, there's some awfully nice fancy dancing shoes you have there. And she's like, ah, thanks. She continues to try to 
uh, trick the old woman into into wearing these red shoes. The old woman takes them away. I think she sneaks them back again. It's a whole back and forth. Um, and when she's in church, it, rather than paying attention to what the preacher is saying, or I don't know, the pastor or whatever kind of church it is, she can't stop admiring her shoes. So she, the whole time she's in church, when she's supposed to be paying attention to God's word, she's rather you know being vain and looking at her shoes and turning her feet this way and that. And then another time later on, you know, after she's done this several times, the creepy soldier again says, makes the remark about her dancing shoes and he taps the shoes. He's got like a, I don't know, something rather that he taps her little shoes with. And she does a little like little dance step show off. And then she finds like her feet start to itch. And that's when the shoes start at first, she's delighted, like, oh, look at me. I could not have fun with these shoes. I could do anything. I could, like, if you were, remember when you were a kid and you would get brand new sneakers and you felt like you yeah. could run faster? Yes. Yeah. It's kind of like yeah. that, isn't it? And um, so that's when she starts, she starts dancing and she's like, oh, that's great. Look what I could do. I could do this. I could do that. I can leap. I can spin. Da, 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 da. And then eventually she's like, okay, I'm ready to stop now. I'm getting a little tired. And her feet do not stop dancing. They keep dancing and keep dancing. And she can't stop and eat. She can't. They're dancing her where she doesn't want to go. They're dancing her into the graveyard. They're dancing her, you know, to not great places. They're dancing her and dancing her and just losing all sense of time. She can't eat. She's, you know, she's becoming like a, like a wraith. I think the, the, the story says, um, eventually she's, she's dancing and she sees that the old woman is, is, I mean, she's either has died or she is dying and, yeah. and they're taking the woman out and they're, they're doing the funeral. She can't go to the funeral because she can't stop dancing. And she finally to a, I don't remember if it's a wood chopper or an executioner. It's an executioner. Right? Yeah, it's an executioner. It's an executioner who lives yeah, in well, like your local, yeah. your local executioner. Your local. Like you have. <laughs> <laughs> you got your dry cleaners. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The executioner. The executioner. And she begs him to cut off her feet so that she can um so that she can renounce her vanity and go to church like a good pious woman so he does he cuts he's like sure he cuts her feet off right and um and she's like oh i'm so relieved and she's on crutches now and she's like okay finally i'm going to i'm going to make up for this and she hobbles herself to church and when she gets to the church her disembodied foot stumps in the red shoes are dancing in front of the church and will not allow her to enter the church. And I forget what happens. That she, this happens a couple of times. Right. And eventually she manages to, I don't remember if the townspeople chase the feet away um, because at this point she's repented for her sins, you know? And so she finally, finally is allowed on her crutches um, to do what she, her heart's desires to come in and sit in, in the presence of God in the church. Mm -hmm. And she hobbles on her crutches into the church and she sits down and she's so grateful to be surrounded by good God fearing people. She's so delighted to, you know, be hearing the pastor speaking that she dies from happiness. She's in church for like, I don't know, 10 minutes. <laughs> she died the end Karen yeah. yeah and and it's all about vanity you know th there's an angel that warns her and like pride this, and pride mm -hmm. and this is you're being selfish and you're all about self-absorbed and that this is your lesson so you, yeah once she gets her feet hacked off she's then at the very end she's like okay I, I've accepted God the God accepts me now and then her soul flies to heaven so she's just she's gone she's just like that's that's what it was all for 1845 <laughs> which a lot of those fairy tales and we've discussed this we did snow white and we've done a few especially because and the little mermaid like, for that matter mermaid. a lot of these fairy tales are grim are, are really like there's some intense lessons going on here and yeah you always you know it but then you don't like i hadn't ever read this one before and like just the the old testament like aspect of it i was like oh my god like he chops off her feet and then just makes her new wooden feet like also does he did he, he just have those lying around he just knows how to right. make some, some wooden feet there but like it What's sounds that about? horrible also i'm not sure they have the medical no 
to like keep somebody alive. After yeah, maybe it wasn't joy that she died from it. <laughs> sure. Just bacteria yeah, that set there in. There might have been some other complications. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But that's often a lesson too. It's about vanity and, and not being righteous. That's kind of a yeah. pretty much a big theme. And the story is used at the background for many things. I just I looked up and HBO had a fairy tale series and there's a there's been other people. Kate Bush has a song called The Red Shoes. I mean, that's also based on the movie. That's the story. So let's get into this amazing movie that I'm telling you both. This was the first time I've seen this movie. I'd never seen it before. Oh, really? what? oh my goodness. Oh, and I have isn't it amazing? I I'm so good. So good. So let's do this. We'll play the trailer and then we will talk about this movie. Red Shoes, daring the original musical that captures all the glamour of the south of France in exquisite technicolour, blending compelling beauty and high drama with a love story of sheer enchantment, assembling a cast of international stars to endow an enthralling film with their rich vitality, and making the outstanding debut of this or any other year, a lovely red-headed girl graced with all the talents, Moira Shearer. There would be no room in my life for anything but dancing. You will think so again, Valia. You're jealous of her. Yes, I am. But in the way that you will never understand. Well, Vicky? Julian, I love you. But you love that more. Directed by Michael Powell and Emmerich Pressburger. This is a very British production. You're sort of going to hear names like Pressburger and somebody's right. name. It's filmed in England. It's one of their, and in Paris. It's of many locations, but it's a very British production. They had also just, they, this is the follow up to Black Narcissus that they covered. Mm -hmm. And yeah. so they also collaborated on the screenplay. And also, they needed to, they made this in the dancing world. They just decided, like, let's just talk about what it's like to be a dancer in a production. It's one of my favorite openings for a movie ever is the way this movie opens, which is all these people just fighting for these seats. They're so excited to go to the ballet. They are. It's the students. Down with parents. All right, let them in.
Hotel Road, the 600. You're sitting on my cloak. Sitting up down below. Another sausage. Not here. Ah. Like a Beatles, like, Elvis. Yes, they're young people. They're oh, they're like yeah, students. Yeah, yeah. yeah. They're rushing. What does he say at the beginning? Death to to tyrants when they wouldn't open the door for them. <laughs> and they're up there forever waiting. It's so for fun. Those. Yeah. Yes, but it's like yeah, it's such a fun opening. You're so you get so excited for, like with them. You're like, oh my goodness, what is this? And some of them are into the dancing, and some of them are into the music, and they That's have- right. They're all snobs and hipsters in their own way. Always yeah. have been. There's always it, been hipster. It's pre rock and roll, yeah. but it is also it is also significantly it's post war England, and yeah. you know a, they've just been through the, the, the blitz, <laughs> and um, this is a time of great austerity. So yeah, I, I can imagine going to see a ballet with like beautiful costumes and beautiful ballerinas and amazing music was probably probably was a kind of whole scene at the time. Although the the play, I mean the um the screenplay was originally developed by um, a producer named Alexander Corda in the 30s, so before before the war, um, this was already kind of in the works. He was married to Merle Oberon, who we talked about yes. when we talked about the Children's Hour. Yes, like these three. This movie is like a big bulletin board with the tacks and the pieces of yarn all over the place. Boslav Nijinsky. No, not Nijinsky. Jagalev, I'm thinking of. Jagalev, who was the um, director of the Ballet Russe. He was this legendary Russian impresario who ran this globally, completely just blow, blew everybody away. Ballet company, Ballet Russe. Uh, I'm talking like kind of post in the teens, you know, back in the teens and 20s. Um, he was lovers with one of the most famous ballet dancers, Nijinsky. Yes, Spring Awakening. And he also had a reputation for firing his dancers when they would get married. In his case, he had a relationship with the man in the, the a male dancer who he got married and he, he kicked both, to all, another dancer, um, kicked them both out of the, comp- out of the company. Nijinsky, the dancer, later had a lot of mental health issues and he really, he, his, it, it, he had to leave dancing because of his deteriorating mental health. And so a lot of the um a lot of that story is in the original screenplay that was developed by Corda, which was then taken over by Pressman and Powell um, in this post-war production. Now, um Let's talk about the cast because we'll come. We'll so put a pin in that on yes. our bulletin board with the yarn, and um, let's talk about the cast of this play because one of the things that Pressman and Powell uh, thought when they took over the production of this after the war was we can't have Merle Oberon's wonderful, and we all agree she's like a great talent, but not a ballerina. And this story is not going to work unless you have actual dancers, because yeah. just it's just not going to not going to fly, if you will. If they did that so, today, they'd do the reverse, right? They would get yeah. The they you'd mm-hmm. get the big actor, and you'd and then they'd brag about how much dancing like that they took. Exactly. But they went the opposite way, which is amazing. Let's and find dancers who can act. They, the, yes, yeah. Exactly. Mm-hmm. And this was Maura Shearer's first movie. Oh my God! You know what I mean? Yeah. How like she is she, first of all? Natural. Oh and she didn't want to do it. No. She, it took her like uh, like year. two years to yeah. talk her into it yes. or something. Yeah, a year to talk her into it. And finally she relented. Um, but yeah, she, I, like, I was shocked when I found out. I was like, she Isn't is. Isn't that incredible? Like, yeah. She How has she not been in movies since she was a tiny girl? She's yeah. such she's a perfect. good actor. Like, she's amazing. She's, yeah. She's so natural in it. She's like, all, there was not a moment where I was like, Oh, you can tell that she's not like a trained, you know, actress. Right. You know, it was everything <laughs> like was like couldn't imagine anybody else doing this. Ça va? Any swelling? I mean the head. All that clapping, bravos, roses, poof, all that's nothing. But when I, who have seen Pavlova Karsavina dance, tell you 
that last night you were not bad. Not good, but not bad. That's something. Now I tell you the truth. It was good. Thank you, Mr. Lubov. My name is Grisha. Mine is Vicky. How do you do? Arms later. So, Boris Lermontov wants to see you. Why in class time? Why? We have Han Walbrook plays Boris Lermontov. I hope I'm saying that right. And I, he's, I love him. He's so he's such an evil guy. Correct? <laughs> he's, he's German. Is he? Um, yes, I mean, I, it sounds that sounds right. See, I, I was told I was I was doing some research, and he was a gay man that was uh, escaped the Nazis. They were going to round him up mm. with you know the Nazis went after homosexuals and crippled people and, mm-hmm. and Jewish people. Uh-huh. We have Marius Goring as Julian Craster. Mm-hmm. Um, Robert Heltman, Ivan Bolslowski, Bolslowski, uh, Leonid, Leonid Mazmin as Grisha, Albert Basterman, Sergei, Ludmila Chernia as Irina. She's the one that gets married. We should say also dancers, they needed the real dancers. These are all dancers, dancers, we should say, that are acting, who could also act. Right. Yeah. And their bodies dancers are Christ. everything. For their work. Yeah, amazing. And so that's one of the reasons why, like, if you're going to get married and have a kid, you're going to, it's going to change your body so much that I, what am I going to do with you? Mm. So, and there were so many people willing to just take your position. I mean, and, Mm -hmm. but they, these people abuse their bodies basically to get maybe a 10, 15 career, year career experience. Yeah. If if you're lucky. If you're lucky. Ballerinas, yeah. Just what it does to the feet, much less like everything else. The only comparable thing is uh, gymnastics, but like, yeah, it is. Yeah. Insane. I agree. So as we said, um, so Boris Lermontov, who's played by Anton Walbrook, Mm -hmm. um, he is based on Jagalev, who is the director of the Ballet Russe. Uh, as I mentioned before, Jagalev had an affair with probably his most legendary star, J- Nijinsky, um, who he booted out of the company when Nijinsky got married to um, a woman. And, and as I said, later on, he had uh, very serious mental health issues. And again, this is a long time ago when behavioral health uh, was uh, extremely um, primitive compared to today. In real life, when Jagalev broke it off with or whoever broke off the relationship between Nijinsky and Jagalev. The next relationship with the dancer that Jagalev, Jagalev had was with a young Leonid Messina who plays Grisha in ah, our film. Okay. So he was a, as you can see in this movie, I mean, he, he might be my favorite dancer in this movie. It's He's great. He's he did amazing. all his own choreography. Yeah, they um, gave him a separate like title for like doing his choreography. Yeah. It's my favorite choreography. Definitely. Yeah. Like when he's if you it's so complicated, first of all. He's a good actor. He's got a very thick accent that he's kind of struggling with at times. Yeah. But as far as his acting ability, it is excellent. Yeah. And uh, but my favorite thing is when he in, has the shoes at his hands and he's making them dance with his hands and they look like there is a ballerina dancing in them, but it's just his hands making them it's incredible. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but he was so he had had quite a long relationship, I think, with Yagalef and the ballet Russe. So he this is a story that was extremely close to his life. I also really like um, sort of queer representation in this movie. It's not like nobody's directly um, stated that they're gay or whatever, but this is certainly like, you know, uh, in the uh, ballet culture or whatever. And like you'd said, there's uh, certainly some of these characters based on uh, people who are known to be gay. I like there's none. There's just in a lot of these old movies, the representation is so terrible. Uh, Gay people are sort of depicted either as villains or just like, just you know just horribly and the the characters who may like who you think like well that that's this person might be gay is he's just a like a complex person who's a great artist and uh fulfilling their role and doing a great job within this whole it's not really commented on it's not like this is a big thing 
It's just that's who they are. I, I really like that and appreciate that in this film. Yeah, they're not coding so much. They're, no, no, no just, they really are. You get in American it's films like just Lord the reality Lord. of just the reality of the culture that they're in, and they're recognizing it and. and yeah, just playing it. Yeah, and he is the king of that world. Yes. Yeah. We should also yeah. say that uh, um, I'm sorry, Margo. Well, first of all, that ballet shoes, toe shoes are very, very brutal on the body. It is very. Ooh. That is the top, top dancing that you could do. And also, at the time, especially the ballet world thought the film world was gross compared to what they did. What they did was yes. art. What yeah. they're doing is is cheap. It's flashy. It's not like what we do. So it was. That very- was part of more Shearer's like thing about not wanting to do it. Right. He's right. like, oh, yeah. She thought it's going to make movies. I'm an artist. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And that's it. So it was very. And then. So, and there, so there is also in the ballet world, there's a little bit of a debate. Like, how close is this to what a real ballet yeah. company is like? And I think backstage and especially the training that these people do, it's very. I mean, they just do every step over and over and over again as they're yeah. building it up. And it's in a very, like I said, it's a very physically, it's a, it's a, it's brutal on their bodies and it's also stressful. And then there's also that nitpicking of you need to drop two pounds and you need to move your shoulder back. And, and there's a lot of manipulation of your body. Like that's done constantly. Is Scorsese had like a kind of a cool commentary. Like yes. he loves the red shoes and he was, talking about like yeah that depiction of like whether or not this is react like close to realism as far as backstage and he's like it doesn't really matter right like they're capturing like what like the feeling of the things the atmosphere and getting that across to an audience that doesn't know ballet itself and certainly doesn't know the the backstage culture of it so they're just getting that and i I do think they get that across very well like i don't know anything about ballet but like It certainly like had a huge appreciation for the rigorousness of it and the physicality of it after watching this movie. Maura Shearer is in the audience watching and she's the niece of someone who's uh, special, who's a who, uh, rich lady, a rich lady, Let's a rich say. lady. She's there in the box with her aunt. Wearing a little crown, like you do. Like one does. <laughs> you, wouldn't we all love to go to ballet with a little crown on? I would. And learn the top is like back, like behind a curtain, like the Phantom of the Opera or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> he, he and, and, does, and, you can see his hand reaching out for like a pen or something. And so there's like, like the cheer. crowd that's up, a, like that's basically like, in you know, all penned together in one spot. And she's in a very cushy spot. But she wants to be a dancer herself. So when she goes yeah. to a party and she talks to the director... <laughs> to Boris he's kind of checking her out and then they're gonna he's gonna give her a chance to try out and you can't I can't emphasize this enough like you do need someone who's a dancer to do this I mean because it would not work if uh if it was Merle Oberman or but she's not even dancing yet she's not she hasn't done a dance move yet and it's all her acting so far and she has to own these scenes and she totally does absolutely does and then when they she tries out and he picks her and you see just all these really great people that she's with Good morning, my dear young ladies. I hope I find you all very well this morning. And there are just one or two things I would like to say to you today. As you know, the bell is leaving the Saturday for Paris. Now, I can't imagine anything more enchanting than being able to invite you, all of you, to accompany us there. But I'm afraid this great pleasure must be denied me. To those whom we must regretfully leave behind, I'd like to say just this, please. Don't be discouraged. The fact that we can't take you with us doesn't mean that you're bad dancers. It just means that this year, unfortunately, we haven't got enough room. Now, would you please step out, Miss Fain, and you, Miss Baines, and you, Miss Hardiman, and Miss Lovett, please. Yes. And may I thank you four ladies very much for the hard work you've done this year. And I'm sure my gratitude is equity of Mr. Lubov. Mm. Yes, and maybe next year we shall be meeting you again. Good morning. Vicky, he means us. They just show up. Uh, also, we should say, sorry, it's Julian uh, Craster. He found Craster. out, finds out that his professor had stolen his work and used his professor music. Professor Palmer, that thief, yeah. He's an, he's an, yeah, Austin Trevor yeah. plays him. So he goes and complains. It's like, hey, this guy stole my music for your stupid play and, and your musical. And so... He gives him a chance to prove that it was actually him and then turns around and says, well, do you want to work here? Eight pounds a week plus blah, blah, blah. And he's like, um, 
yeah. yeah. <laughs> I love the French that's that's spoken here with the English, like the Frank English or whatever you want to say. I also what I love what Lermitov is wearing. I don't know what that is. It's like a like okay. a Cossack or something. Like, Listen, what? Let me just say right off the bat that on all counts of this film, I am one hundred percent team Lermontov. First <laughs> yeah, of all, yeah. sunglasses gold. I want all the sunglasses and all the hats. Oh and yeah, like, great. When he's, on the yeah, train. He's, on the train, that the he's got those kind of kind of like cat eye ones, and then he's yeah. also got the the wire he's, rim. He's got like, the most wonderful mustache too. Uh, yes. yes. That who dapper that, and villainous at the same time. Exactly. So like, and he's like, just a little, yeah, just a little more villainous, please. And then yeah, he's just <laughs> chilling. He's just chilling, having his breakfast in a silk. It is yeah. silk. Embroidered all the way to the ankles. All the way. <laughs> <laughs> that is just what he wakes Come up on. in. He just wakes up. He woke like, up yeah, like this. My morning. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I also I want to rewind to the party real quick because it's one of my favorite lines. Um, the the uh, aunt or whatever is is trying to talk him into seeing, uh, and he's giving her a speech about how um, you know ballet is not you know ballet is his religion, and you don't want to see a religious practice in such a place. But then he like sort of brushes her off and leaves, and she she gives him like the the best backhanded compliment ever. She goes, "Attractive brute." <laughs> <laughs> I love it. And everything he says in this film, he's totally right. He's he's one hundred percent right. Yeah. yeah, you invite him to the party to make him work. Get out that of here. That is very true. Yeah. What is that about? Yeah. And everything he says to um both Moira and both uh, Vicky, uh, Victoria Vicky Page. Page, Victoria and Page. The fact that her last name is Page, like a blank sheet, you know. Yes, exactly. Her, you know? Yeah. Everything he says to her is one hundred percent true. Everything he says to Craster, the composer. Is a hundred percent true. He's he's super generous to both of these nobodies. You know? I love that Craster shows it up really also, is. and he wrote a note to him, like really pissed off, like this person stole my work, and then was like, "Oh, I shouldn't have done that. I'm going to kill my career." Runs to him and says, "Please don't open that envelope because who hasn't done this before? You sent the email or the text <laughs> that right. you give anything to take back." But he also yeah. is just like, yeah, he has good instincts. He realized this guy's going to be the next generation of composer. I need to work with him now. He puts yeah. them both on the world stage. And not only that, he's 100% upfront with them. Listen, I do not tolerate romances in my company. And here's why. So I, I don't think he's the villain. No. <laughs> He's just I don't wow. think he's the villain in this piece. I'm gonna, I'm gonna say that. I know it's my take. I'm with you. Impossible. I like how he always says impossible for things. That like like it's a, like that's his like insult. Your score is impossible. Your dancing is impossible. Well, of course, Julian and Vicky fall in love. It's, it's, <laughs> it's just it meant to, to happen. Be. It had yeah. to happen, yeah. and that's becoming and be, and Ludmila, who is one of, is a real life dancer. She's and boy, is she beautiful. Oh, she's like the Betty. other prima ballerina in oh, the company. Yeah. That's like yeah. Betty she, Page. She's like, more of what her. you think of. Yeah, you think of when yeah. you're like the prima donna of like, shows up 40 minutes late and is like, you will start when I get here, you know, type of thing. But also she she isn't as bad as they make her. Like no. she's, you know, she, yeah. Like in the end, like she's like a sweetheart, I think. But yeah. She gets married and she's gonna, she has to go. So then that, that gives Vicky her big chance. But of course, Vicky and Julian fall in love, much to the yeah. consternation of their boss there's so much here that i also like the settings are amazing monte carlo the oh i know it's such eye candy and i and i just imagine like a post-war audience going and seeing this on the big screen in technicolor you would the go colors. see it every as many times as you possibly could yeah the colors, the colors are amazing are amazing the sets it makes me hate cgi so much yes I love those sets. Well, They're amazing. So we should say Scorsese was a part of it. He is a super fan of this movie. He owns like original red shoes signed by Morris Shearer. He oh, has wow. scripts. He has everything. And so he was the person that said, we need to revitalize this film and save it. And so yeah. they filmed it in black and white. 
and they had and the person that was in charge of it was a um an artist not a photographer not a film person like he was a cinematographer was jack carter so they filmed it and it was on three different frames and then they color coated them coat soaked them in color and then put them together and the only way that they could fix it was digitally so they went back for every single those so there's three things three films they have to go through and then put the color in again and then they enriched it because sometimes Ah. it can look blurry and it's his work they did such a good job it's yeah it's 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 not like because they captured that thing it's not like it's a real color it doesn't like it's a real color it's got to be it doesn't it doesn't uh, yeah exactly Um, for it to work right for it to look right um yeah there's reds and golds and blues and they're just and then with with her red hair and her pale skin i mean oh i I know all those like it, freckles when you like she's uh, like, she got all these like freckles it's down there amazing. that they didn't it's, like put makeup on to cover up, no, you know. It's, no, it's, yeah, it's it's spectacular. The, yeah, the whole look of it, the music, of course, is yes. is wonderful. And I love that we get again, I'm I'm Team Lermontov. He's so <laughs> honest with her. She got the job in the first place because the other chick got married. So you know what the rules are. Yeah, ladies, like, go you know in. Up. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And um and so does the composer know what he's doing by falling in love with her. He's ruining her career. So there, I I think he's the villain. Well, um, and so- also I do I kind of agree with that too because I was thinking towards the end, Lermontov puts the puts the question to uh, Victoria Page, uh, like has he has he volunteered to give up what you're giving yeah. up? Like he's you doing that? Like her career, she has the bigger career. Like he's a talent, uh-huh. for sure, but she's the yep. international star. Like she like has the bigger career. She has the bigger life. Like it's like, did he ask her to give up? And like, no, he did. He, no. he didn't offer to like give that up for her. And let's be, let's be fair. Like he can be a composer for the rest of his life. She can't be a prima ballerina for the rest of her life. That's a very good point. Yeah. 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 I think he's the villain. Do you do you think Mary's Goring hat like could play the piano? Because it really like you can usually tell if he when couldn't. It's, it's convincing, it right? Because yeah. they're showing the fingers and they're showing him doing like the things, which usually they kind of do cuts where you don't see that, and it looks very much like he's doing it very well. Oh, what I was going to—I remember now. So he Lermontov, you know, is giving her again, giving them both this global platform. He commissions this ballet that he loves it so much. He's commissioning a second ballet from the from the composer from Maria Scoring's character. And what I love in the movie is that we get to see these snippets of Moira Shearer dancing in all of these other roles, like as the time is going by, like we see her in Swan Lake and we see her in Sleeping yeah. Beauty, I think, and, and, you know, different, different famous ballet roles that we get to see her do, uh, which again, for a post-war British audience, I, I can't imagine how dazzling, I mean, it's dazzling now. Yeah. Yeah. So- but also like, we haven't really talked about the ballet, the fact that they stopped the movie. Right. Like uh-huh. the movie, and how long is it? Like a tw- it's like twenty minutes, it's right? A, it's seventeen almost minutes twenty minutes and something. Yeah. yeah, of like a ballet that just happens with these amazing, like it's a it's a ballet that they're performing, and it feels like the, the like the set of a really cool ballet, really well done. But then they do these really cool cinematic movie tricks and movie <laughs> tricks that nobody else was doing, and they just go for it in every like single like. Some of them they work really a little bit do. others, but you got to admire just like how much they're going for it every single time. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and we, and we don't even, I think we don't even hear, I'll double check that in just a second, but I think the movie is called the red shoes right? and there's not a mention of the red shoes until we're like 40 minutes into this movie. Yeah. Uh, we are, we are well into the story of this movie before the red shoes even comes up at all. And yeah, you're right. We're and then we're an hour in when everything screeches to a halt and we're all just gonna watch a ballet now and it's spectacular. Yeah. And you and I, you know, because I'm once again, I'm not a ballet guy, I'm not a like a dance guy. So like I, like I'm but I'm an old movie guy. So when I'm first watching this, I'm like, oh, okay, no. But like we're gonna and but like you I was enraptured that in like entire time. I am like 
oh my god like don't ever stop just keep going like it, it was fantastic i also love how when the red shoes come in they're they're it's own they're their own character right they do a thing of like picking them out as if they're auditioning they have the little thing with a stick of like not this one not this one oh those are the red shoes and then they become like a character for the rest of the movie it's, a, it's such a great it does so many great subtle things I, love I the haven't seen this movie. Thing, this newspaper man. Oh my gosh! When the guy turns into newspaper, oh my what? God. Yeah, the the little so foreshadowing they do earlier when uh, they first well, a couple of foreshadowings when they first Vicky and they first find out that they're both doing the red ballet. They're on that balcony and the train goes by underneath, and you're like, oh my god, yeah. yeah. Um, but then afterwards, <laughs> she goes and steps on a newspaper, and it's got both of them in it. And then, yeah, you see the dancing newspaper that turned into the dancing man covered in newspaper. I hadn't seen this film in a really long time, and my memory of it, in my memory of it, the character of Lermontov was a, it was that it was a very similar thing to that that critic character in laura yeah, yeah he he's gay he's obsessed with her um he's you know he he's he's um she becomes sort of a protege of his and and but he becomes obsessed to the point of destroying her uh, and and watching this i was i was kind of surprised watching this as i said i was watching going like what What's wrong with what he's saying? Like he's he owns this company. It's his business. It's he's built a very successful repu global reputation. He's got all these people depending on him. Yeah, he's got some rules that he needs to do to protect his business, and he's really clear about them. I feel <laughs> you know, really um, which is it's a, he's kind of a different character. And I remembered, you know, as a as a young much younger person being like, well, she should be able to marry the guy but now i'm like well what's this who's this composer guy just coming in and like making her give up her dreams she For, says got, to us that she that that's all she's dancing because she just can't do anything else she doesn't want to do anything right. else it's yeah. like, it's life for yeah. her it's yeah that's choice. what she why why do you live you know right. i don't know why but i i must and that's the same uh, like a couple of little things because Lormatov is he does he does have his rules and he does have his company but he is pretty possessive like unhealthily oh, I will seriously say, possessive yeah and there's a couple Definitely. of times like um uh like for one I love how he keeps getting whiter as the like by the time he's on the train his shoulder pads like, you mean yeah, he's like a he's like a ghost like he's oh like, you he's mean his face whiter, whiter like like, like, like the color of the white. yeah his skin yeah. gets more yeah. and more pale because yeah, he never goes outside that's what he's got to have yeah he does like during COVID right yeah exactly um but then also there's a couple like one where um and she starts to say something he's like Ch -ch -ch. i'll do the talking you do the dancing and i was like oh that's okay that's a little that's a little much for us like uh let's let's dial it back a little bit um yeah they're both i think it's i think it's such a good because they're it's control it's about controlling men that's what i think is i'm not sure if that was it's what totally they about were that really depicting when they um like were making was that, movies. yeah i'm not sure if was that, that the was the intention yeah but i mm. it really works it really works i think that's why this movie also endures is because it really works on a more modern level of how like we can see that we can empathize with more uh, women can be like yes in so many aspects of you don't have to be a ballerina this is a, you know a, an extreme situation but to see that men controlling like trying to control women's your bodies life changes when you have a, when you get married you have kids like you're supposed to yeah. put all your dreams to the side yeah there's no work accommodations for you like you know there's things you have to give up your job we were going to promote you but now you have a kid so you know that like all these things are like very like like translatable and relatable to today that i that, and i i don't really think that that's what they were going for it was art and obsession uh, that's what they're going art for. And, exactly exactly like you have to you have to suffer for your art is kind of like and we still talk idea. about that to this day yeah yeah it's well still the, a thing. That, yeah i think all the time of that end scene where her her now husband um the composer and her boss who she's already made the decision to go back and work for, right? Yeah. They are arguing, literally arguing over her, and she's in the middle. And neither one of them is seeing her as an actual person in any of this, you know? Yeah. Um, Lermontov is like, basically, this is my business asset. My, you know, I'm trying to 
protected. I, I've got, there's literally like curtains about to go up, but also her husband is like, basically I want her cause, cause you want her kind of almost, it seems like he's not really looking at her and seeing how, what he's saying and doing and putting her in this position of having to choose uh, what that is doing to her at all. And either one of them is seeing her as a, as a person and that she's breaking in the middle of them. Right. It's both, they're both using different means of control for it. Like there's the, like, there's very few, I mean, especially at this time, there's very few opportunities for women to like, just have a non-traditional life, much less a life of art and creativity and stardom, right? So there's, he's like, like doing that, like, and if you don't do it with me, you're not going to be able to like, do this. Like I, I'm the one who will make you, I'm alone who will give you this life. Um, yeah. And then... Then the other is like the more traditional, like family and love and like things. And he's like, you, I, if like, I have that, and if you don't, you have to choose between one or the other. And it just like breaks her, which is such a good, I don't know. It just works on so many like levels still. It's we, a great. Well, also so. since, um, I mean, we, we've known, Margo and I are both, <laughs> we're women. We've known this for a long time, but this Me Too movement, I think uh -huh. made a lot of men realize like, oh, women are made to feel bad about themselves in the slight never they never want people to feel bad so they're always like they bend themselves into a pretzel to make themselves amenable to very difficult people especially difficult men like your harvey weinsteins or you know that that's just how you get a role in hollywood and that's just how you get ahead it really i mean it's haunting it i'm sure I, so what was it like seeing it for the first time? I can't believe you've never seen this movie I before. I don't know why I never saw it before. I love a chorus line, and that's like one of my favorite musicals, and they talk about... I know. What can I tell you? I just have some gaps. That's why we do the show, Margo, because... That's right. <laughs> this is true. This we is true. things we've never would have read before, and we... And so I watched it two and a half times this week. I want to watch it again. Just gorgeous. It's so beautiful just to look at and to listen. And um, Maura Shearer, I'm just a hugest fan of now. I wish she'd done a million movies. Like, Oh, I know. My God. She, I mean, just the, 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 the way she's able to express herself through movement is so impressive and, and, move. and moving. Um, that when... At the end of the movie, that's oh yes, we should talk about. The you ending. could never do this with a not dancer, right? So that that right. ending freezes, and then you see her feet, and the feet are sort of like a little bit twitchy, and you're like, oh no! And the her her dancers, you know, the attendant, the maid who's who's helping her get ready, like sees that something is real wrong, and she goes screaming off for help. She races again. Spoiler alert: uh, she <laughs> races off the balcony you know down to the to the train track below but if you look at and you like you if you pause it even or, or slow it down it's like the feet are dancing away from her over the balcony it's it's like she's not in control of her feet they are just going on their own just like in the ballet i love that moment in the ballet too where she the character where she's playing karen i guess realizes that these feet these shoes are not letting me go back home they're not letting me i want to go here but my feet are going there and she you see her fighting it's very convincing um and it's a similar thing when she at the end when she goes um and it's very quick but her physicality of that scene is so impressive I'm sorry to tell you that Miss Page is unable to dance tonight. Nor indeed any other night. Nevertheless, We've decided to present 
Dress shoes! It is the belly that made her name, whose name she made. We present it because we think she would have wished it. So she just totters out of the theater and then we hear the train coming and her husband is looking towards her and she leaps and we don't know did she make it happen or the feet made her is she we don't know it's suicide or what it is or yeah. she's possessed or some magical obsession of this like the red shoes come to life yeah um, and it's like a beautiful swan dive kind of that she does too Everything even that is, is like beautiful <laughs> even that is like this beautiful like dance move like it's so know, convincing like, yeah. it's so gorgeous it, yeah also, and she has then, this great looks on oh, her face ahead. like a couple of times, like um, oh. when she's doing that first sort of practice dance, bef like before, like she's getting her first dance before, and she's and they do that too cool camera thing yes. where she's doing the spinning and then the camera spins with it, so you get oh. the perspective. And she stops and she sees Lermontov in the audience, and she has this look on her face, like I don't even know how to describe this look, but it's just wide eyed, like kind of like crazy and like. I've done it, you know, kind of like thing, yeah. you know, like, oh my God, like this look, I've never seen that look on anybody else before. It's the eyes it, in this it, movie are incredible. The, the eyes are, it, yes. The eye acting. Yeah. <laughs> it's, eye acting. It's it's for, everybody, for everybody, for yeah. everybody. When, when Lermontov like smashes the mirror. No, oh, yeah. no. I mean, it's just, it is so, so And then he good. comes out the but, end and says, Miss Page will not be able to perform this evening. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, and he's I like, so over <laughs> like, and he has to sort of shout it with emotion. Yes, you know, yes. because he's to a theater, so it's like I hadn't even thought about that because it's got to be a live theater, so he's got to project all the way. So it's an emotional like yelling. It's uh, you know, so amazing. Good. Yeah, he's trying to say it really clearly. He's trying to not break. Yeah, he but he has to communicate this to the entire giant audience that's there and then i love they decide to do the ballet the do the ballet but without her there so they but what we the audience sees is just the beginning and how weird that looks you know the absence of her the void of that but and we understand because we've already seen the entire ballet yeah. we understand with only seeing this little glimpse of it like that they're gonna this audience is now going to sit through the whole thing that we've just seen but without more sure there right <laughs> yeah they have like a spotlight the but nothing is, like the spotlight's in the right place but there's nobody in the spotlight ah like that's so smart yeah and, yeah yeah, yeah and but i mean it's just i it, it's so good it's just so good <laughs> the scene when they're they're in love and she's dancing and he's conducting um her husband is conducting and he's and Lermontov is observing because Again, this is his company, um, and the conductor winks and blows a kiss at her. I said, "Like, dude, you're at work, <laughs> really? Yeah, you are at work, sir. Yeah, this is. I do not. I, Team Lermontov. He's Call showing off. Check that out. Do you see that? Yeah, me. She's me. I yeah. I love how how much how hard you're defending Lermontov. <laughs> <laughs> It's it's like he's your uncle or something, and you're like he was done dirty. That's how I feel. Um, it's, it's, it's all fake news how he was portrayed. Right, right. The villain presented the actual villain <laughs> because yeah. he 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 is an impresario. He you know, but it again, it's different than it's it was different than how I remembered it as a watching it as a younger person. And to use the example of Laura again. You know, you have where you have this a very similar kind of 
dynamic and set up between these two characters. Um, it, but when Laura, like he really, he really wants to possess her completely mind, body, soul, every moment of the day, he wants to be in control of Laura. And she, in the end, if you remember at the end of the movie, like she really feels sorry for him and she goes, she, she accompanies his, 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 him in the ambulance. Right. But I feel like here, like he really, it really is about her ability as an artist that he is interested in. He's not about, it's not that he doesn't want her to have love in her life. It's that, you know, you told me that this is the thing that's important to you. And so we're going to do this thing. We're going to, I'm going to put you on this stage. And um, yeah, I, I just felt like he was super upfront with her, even though he's, he's a domineering kind of a person. And he didn't try to sabotage their relationship either. He just made her choose. He does. And he does, he does want her to choose him. That is definitely, it is her choice. Uh, mm-hmm. In the end, he does, he's not doing anything to like physically force her. He even acknowledges like you can go dance at other places, yeah. um, but nothing like, you know, you want to be the best and you know, you can only be the best with me. Like, right. Those are Which is true. Things. Which is very true. It is. Somebody, um, this movie, for those of you who've never seen it, it's streaming for free on YouTube right now. It's not bootleg or anything. <laughs> Again, mm-hmm. YouTube has been putting a lot of stuff out for free, like a lot of classic movies, uh, making them available to stream for free. This is one of them right now that you can watch for free. And one of the comments uh, that somebody put on the video on YouTube was, it said something like, let's just face it, if she goes with Julian, that's his name, if she goes with Julian, what's going to happen is she's going to end up having to dance for way longer than she normally would have in not as great places because she's going to have to support him for the rest of her life (laughs) because he's not going to be as successful as she is yeah maybe the shoes knew that (laughs) i don't know (laughs) yeah it's so funny to see i to see people's takes on it but it's and it's not just about like the trickery of of cinema these these effects it's about the way that they the story is told it's a story it's the story that stays with you that is so haunting it's really good. I, I the the artistic like the artistic way that they done the movie magic in this too is just so many chances taken, mm-hmm. so many like um like you didn't have to be that risky and they're like at that time I'm sure like I mean British cinema was not a risk taking, mm-hmm. you know, place either. I mean, they just did Black Narcissus. One of them, is it Powell who goes on? Does he do Peeping Tom? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Which, like, is with, the also with more Hitchcock sure. movie that wasn't made by Hitchcock, like, ever. <laughs> so, like, they're just great experimentalists. They're great artists. They're, yeah, there's so many risks that they didn't have to take that they did. Um, I think the movie budget was, like, 500,000 pounds, which I, I'm sure was a lot, like, at that time. But it was a huge hit. Both, I think, in the United States, they made like uh, two million or something, and then internationally, like I'd wait in line to see this. Are you kidding me? Oh like, yeah, forty-eight. I would be. This would be thrilling. I, I'm sure yeah. Radio City or something. Yeah, I'm, we should say that it was nominated for Academy Awards Best Picture, Original Screen, No Acting Honors. Uh, it won right. for Original Score right. and the Art Direction, and I think it should have won for il- Film Editing, by the way, because. That is a I huge know. hero in this movie. But Tour anyway. de force with the editing, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And there really hasn't, like, I mean, there's The Black Swan, um, uh, which is a good movie or whatever, but, like, to, like, to, like, try to find another movie that's done, you know, anything it, close to this sense is, like, point? really hard. Is the turning point about yeah. that? I think Anne Bancroft's yeah. in that. There's Amazon has that too. It's okay. I'll, I'll, I'll check that out. It's like a 78, 79. And okay. it's definitely, it's about the ballet world. And I love anything with Anne Bancroft. That's just, you know. Absolutely. Yeah. But agreed. yeah, I'm, tr- I'm trying to think of like actors that can, like John Travolta can act and can dance. And yeah. and it's essential to his character in Saturday Night Fever. But yeah, how many can, people can do both? And I'm just completely. At that level? At I that mean, level, I don't know. I mean, yeah. she is a natural. But then. But then, like when you see when you see those musical things, those are usually pretty straightforward 
you know, like if they're going to like, oh, we're going to do a musical. It's like, I guess the closest would be something like Moulin Rouge, where like he's really doing some cool experimental movie mm -hmm. magic stuff with, mm -hmm. you know, music and dancing and stuff like that. But like you don't see those. Usually if you see that, they're like, we're, we're going to make a try to make a pretty straightforward musical that, you know, but not risk taking like that they're doing yeah. here in a big way. But there's also an American in Paris. Yeah, which yeah. has that break for a, for a, a very real ballet, Oklahoma. Um, yeah. Oh yeah, Oklahoma. Oklahoma did but but it's not a story about that world. Yeah. Well, yeah. American Paris is like I think they knew they could do that because of this movie, right? Oh, like, there's no way you have American in Paris without this film. Right. I think. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It doesn't exist. Yeah, yeah. Uh -uh. and we haven't really talked about like it's such a horror film too. Like it is such it's a totally a horror like film. yeah. Like people Terrible. like I don't think that they knew they were making a horror film, but obviously those those directors have those sensibilities, and like it has had so much influence on the horror genre, and it is one of those like psychologically horrifying movies. Like there's not a lot of blood and like you know like one death in it uh, like thing, but like it is a like bones deep horrifying movie you know that really like you just think about it for days afterwards a ballet movie yeah. too <laughs> yeah it's a ballet movie yeah and those those scenes there was a horror scenes like those like when, the, when the, she the, has the knife in the ballet and she's gonna and it yeah. turns into a twig and she throws it down and it turns back into a knife yeah what? <laughs> yeah what is happening and then she like i love the parts where they um during the ballet because they also they intermix some psychological things of like yeah we're doing a straight up ballet but then the guy turns into um the guy who's like uh like the in the ballet the main bad guy he turns into Lermatov and then he turns into Craster and then yeah. she like dances into the silhouette of his his empty silhouette I'm like what what yeah. is going on that's insanely cool that's yeah. just yeah just such a cool movie I recommend I definitely. Yeah. So, yeah. are we saying we love that we love the movie better? The movie, yes. Than the oh. movie, definitely. Yeah. I mean, definitely. I take it over, over Karen yeah. uh, die, cutting off her feet and it's <laughs> dying very, in church. But it's very easy to get. It's a super short read. It's like twelve pages, not even that. Yeah. So definitely it's, check it out if you're interested. It, it does explain the ballet, by the way. Yeah. Oh yeah. 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 It definitely hit me. Like when I read the story, though, I was like, "Oh my god!" Like it stuck with me. And I'll like talk about somebody who, I mean, like the horror genre didn't really exist yet, but like Hans Christian Andersen is certainly a horror writer. Like uh, he is, yeah, yeah, horrific. And the the modern like takes on a lot of his stuff are Disney, but like this is a good this is a good child of Hans Christian Andersen. Um, the the you know it doesn't have the religious message or whatever, but like the like the horrifying. And the darkness of it is definitely yeah, there. Yeah, not really. I don't know if it's a morale. I don't know what you learn from it. The ballet it. is the religion. Yes. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, it is. He says that right there, doesn't he? He says, mm -hmm. yeah, ballet is my religion. And yeah, yes. That's, that's true. They worked so many, like, subtle things in mm -hmm. um, to the thing. Yeah. It's great. Who was the screenplay? I've forgotten all of a sudden. The screenplay, screenplay is by um, uh, Powell Pressburger. Oh. Um, Marius Goring, they also credit Hans Christian Andersen and Keith Winter on, like, not in the, like, the credit things. I think it's just press mm -hmm. for their album. But um, I think in the original, they, they gave Hans Christian Andersen some credit, too. Hans Anderson, that's how they called him, too. <laughs> yeah, I was like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Real chummy, I guess. Anderson. All right. There's quite a few Good of them, but okay. <laughs> <laughs> So next week we have a, another guest, yes. but we'll get to that. We're going to keep that a little bit of a surprise. And um, and I'll just say that if you are a longtime listener of uh, the podcast, you might you might enjoy next week's episode. We're so glad, Dale, that you were able to join us. Can you one more time give us a plug for your book? Tell people where they can get it. Uh, so the book is called The Mean Reds. It's a title uh, taken from Breakfast at Tiffany's, which um, movie fans are the only people that ever know uh, where that came from. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, it is a uh, fun um, uh, sort of noir satire modern thing with a just a ton of 
uh, movie Easter eggs in it, especially old movies uh, that movie fans are going to love. Uh, and you can, of course, get it on Amazon. Um, you can go to my publisher's website, which is uh, Stephen F. Austin uh, State University Press. Um, you can go to my website, which is dalebridges.org. And you can buy it through uh, any of those uh, means or just Google it online. If you do purchase it, I'd love to get a uh, rating from it on Amazon and Goodreads. That'd be great as well. And tell them your social media. Uh, I'm on Facebook. Just uh, you go to Dale Bridges on uh, Instagram. Um, I'm at uh, bridges.writer. And I want to say also, Dale, uh, you are an artist. And I was looking at your artwork. You have a separate website yes. for your art. And it's beautiful. You're Oh, thank you so much. Talented. Oh, thank you. Yeah, I got that was sort of a thing I got more into during the pandemic, and I've really been enjoying it. Um, and that's up at dalebridgesart.com. Once again, um, everybody, if you have ideas, please you know, reach out to us at all those places we mentioned at the top of the show. Our email, once again, is book versus movie podcast at gmail.com. Margo, do you want to tell them what we're doing for the next episode? I mean, we have the interview, but then we're going to cover just to give people time. But then after that, if in case you all want to read along, those of you, we know some of you follow along with us. We're going to be covering three days of The Condor. We both have our copies yep. <laughs> by James Grady, filmed in Brooklyn Heights, I think you said. Yeah. Yep. yep. Filmed in yeah. New York City and much of it in Brooklyn Heights. Margo, where can they find you? You can find me online at coloniabook.com and all of my social media callouts are at She's Nacho Mama. And where can they find you? You could find me on Twitter at Brooklyn Margot. I'm at Brooklyn Fit Chick for Instagram threads. That's my site. And my TikTok is at my name, Margot Donahue. And I do have some clips of the red shoes on there if you want to see for yourself. All right, everybody, stay safe, be well, and we'll be back soon with a new episode. Thank you so much for listening to the Book vs. Movie Podcast. We are a part of the Frolic Podcast Network. You can find more podcasts you will love at frolic.media forward slash podcasts. We follow the hashtags Lady Pod Squad and Potter and Family. If you want to support the show, you can go to our Patreon page, go to P-A-T-R-E-O-N and look for Book versus Movie Podcast. We have a basic Facebook page, but we also have a private Facebook group. Go to Facebook and type in Book vs. Movie Podcast group if you want to join that. You can follow us on Twitter and Instagram at Book vs. Movie. Spell all those words out. If you'd like to send us an email, it's Book vs. Movie Podcast. Spell that all out at gmail.com. You can follow Margot D at Brooklyn Fit Chick on social media and Margot P at She's Nacho Mama. Thanks so much again for checking out our show, and we'll be back soon with a new episode. <laughs>